So here we go. Um, once again, we wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, typically we give tours of the VLA because we again are all located in Socorro, New Mexico, uh, just an hour east of the very large array. Um, but in addition to those tours, um, we have started doing themed tours um, to give um, a chance to highlight more uh, that NRAO does and the other facilities that we have. Um, so today's tour, today's theme is the Very Long Baseline Array or VLBA. Um, most people don't know a lot about it, so we're really excited to tell you about it today. And one thing we just want you to keep in mind and bear with us is that Socorro Internet is not the best or the fastest. Um, so please forgive us for any technical difficulties. Um, and again, you can let us know about those in the chat if you're having any technical difficulties that you think might be on our end. Um, but otherwise, we want you to focus on using the Q&A feature for any questions. Um, we will have dedicated time for questions at the end of the tour. Um, we will also have two different guest speakers who will join us for that. So you can submit any questions you have um, during the tour or specifically for them once their segments start. Um, and only use the chat if you need to let us know of some sort of problem. We will also share some of the links to the websites um, or web features that we talk about in the chat, but you will also receive a follow-up email from Zoom after the webinar with all of those links. So if you don't catch them in the chat, don't worry, you'll still get them. And just once again, links over here, questions over here. Um, we love answering your questions, um, but there's a good chance that we might not be able to get to all of them. So if we didn't uh, get a chance to answer yours, or if you think of another question um, anytime after today, we do have a very cool Ask an Astronomer feature on our webpage. Um, the link will go in the chat and you will get it, but we have an astronomer on duty. And if you search the archives and you'd find that anything that you're looking to know is not already answered, you can ask a new question. And within 72 hours, someone will get back to you. Okay, so let's dive into the main topic for today, the very long baseline array. Um, this instrument, we kind of refer to the entire thing as an observatory or a telescope or an instrument, but it's made up of 10 separate antennas that are scattered in various locations across North America, um, both in US states and territories. And all of the antennas are linked together and operated here in Socorro, New Mexico. The control room is located with us here. And the VLBA makes use of something that we call very long baseline interferometry. Um, and I'll explain it a little bit more, but essentially it's interferometry, which is what we mean when we talk about combining signals from pairs of antennas over long baselines, meaning the distance between a pair of antennas. So the long baselines, meaning those antennas are very far apart. Um, and for example, uh, we'll get into the details of these particular antennas, but the distance between this one, our westernmost and our easternmost is actually over half the diameter, sorry, almost half the diameter of the earth. So that means it's gonna be a very powerful instrument. So the good way to think about what very long baseline interferometry does for us is something my grad school advisor used to say, big is small, small is big. And what that means is the bigger the spread of the antennas on the ground, the smaller the detail that they can see on the sky. And the smaller the distance between the antennas on the ground, the larger the structure that they can see on the sky. And it's kind of equivalent to a zoom lens, which um, most people are familiar with if you use a camera. Um, and even on your phone, your phone can do a zoom. So essentially that's what these telescopes allow us to do. We use this example when we're giving tours at the VLA um, because we have specific set configurations that the VLA can be in, but the largest one spreads the antennas out. So big spread on the ground to see small detail on the sky. And it essentially is 22 miles in diameter. And so then you can see that you get these tiny um, resolution, you get resolution of these smaller structures on the sky. And then if we take the, VLA and put it in its smallest configuration, so small on the ground, big on the sky, um, you see that that same radio galaxy that we're looking at here now looks like this, because there's a lot of other emission that is on bigger 
diffuse um, scales and in the tight, sorry, in the largest configuration, you uh, zoom in past all of that. So you miss what's happening. And so sometimes it's actually really useful to be able to do both of these types of observing. Um, a great example of the biggest small, small is big with the VLBA, which we're gonna go into more detail today, is this radio galaxy. Um, keep in mind, these are false colors. They're just showing brightness on the sky. But this big structure here is what the VLA saw when looking at this radio source. And this tiny little thing here zoomed in, this is what the VLBA could see. So with its much longer baselines, much, much more small detail on the sky. So I mentioned earlier that the VLBA has 10 antennas um, located across North America. So there's one antenna at each station that's a 25 meter dish, which is um, pretty much the same size as the VLA antennas, 25 meters in diameter, uh, just over 80 feet in diameter. Each station also has a control building. Um, and we always have two, roughly two technicians at each site who do the troubleshooting and the maintenance for each of the telescopes, uh, antennas. And during the observing runs, when all of these antennas are observing, um, at each of their stations, that's where the data is amplified, digitized, recorded. Um, and then they actually have to send those recordings to New Mexico at DSOC. Um, we'll let the operator that we have today tell you more about that. But it um, it's, sounds like an old archaic process, but it's just faster way to get the data to us is to mail it through the mail than actually try and upload it, download it through the internet. One of the uh, big differences between a VLA and a VLBA antenna is their base and how they rotate in what we call azimuth. So this is where they rotate to go from north to south to east to um, west. And the VLA antennas are actually permanently, they sit um, on three concrete piers. And so those piers don't move when the antennas are stationed there, but they have a bearing um, a gear, essentially a ginormous circular gear halfway up the telescope that allows them to do this turning. The VLBA antennas, um, they actually sit on a single railroad track, which um, is just kind of crazy cool. Um, so they actually have four railroad wheels that are stationed there. So the telescope turns on that track. Here's a that's the part to sort of pay attention to. That's the difference between them. And I have a couple close-ups of what that looks like. So as you can see, it's a single railroad track. And that's one of four wheels um, that the telescope sits on. And then they both have a similar dish on top that moves in a similar way to point um, towards the horizon and towards the zenith. So I thought it would be fun just to sort of really show you in situ what each of these 10 antennas look like. So the farther and westernmost is Mauna Kea, um, which is a dormant volcano on the top of the big island of Hawaii. Um, and you may have heard of it because it's an international site for um, astronomical observatories of all different types. There's optical telescopes up there, infrared, ultraviolet, um, and our radio one. Um, and one of the good things about any kind of telescope location is our preference is always high and dry to get above the majority of Earth's atmosphere and above the moisture that's in that atmosphere. Um, so Mauna Kea is, um, you know, a whopping uh, 14,000 feet in altitude. So pretty high makes pretty dry. Um, the next one uh, is Brewster, Washington. So I kind of included a map here um, for anyone who may be somewhat familiar with US geography, but not total. So it's kind of in the middle in the north of the state. Um, it can get a lot of different types of weather. Um, Owens Valley, California. So this one is here sort of in the Sierra, um, south of the Sierra and north of Death Valley, which is a very dry place. So that's good. Um, it's actually uh, near a town called Bishop, California, very tiny. Um, the next one is Kitt Peak, Arizona. 
And like Mauna Kea, Kitt Peak is also a place where there is our multiple observatories, um, some of which you can see in this picture here. Um, and Kitt Peak is roughly um, just under 7,000 feet in altitude. Um, and it's one of uh, 22 telescopes that are on the site there. And now here in New Mexico, we're actually super lucky and we get to have two out of the 10 VLBA antennas. The first one is in a place that is actually called Pie Town for people that have never heard of it. Um, there are three Pie Town restaurants there um, and it's literally serves the greatest pie. And this uh, antenna is just outside of Pie Town. And the second one in New Mexico is at Los Alamos National Laboratories. So that's kind of closer to Santa Fe. Um, Pie Town itself, sorry, is just uh, another 40 minutes um, west of the VLA. So from Socorro, we can get there quite fast. Again, Los Alamos. There's one in Texas, um, a little town called Fort Davis. And that's actually the highest town in Texas. So it's at 5,000 feet above sea level. Um, and I'm guessing this photo is probably a very old photo um, from that coloring. And then we have uh, one in Iowa, um, North Liberty, Iowa. So that's kind of near Iowa City, just uh, west of Chicago. Um, and this antenna actually hosts um, visitors, uh, students from the local universities and colleges um, can go there and occasionally they will have public tours. Most of them, these antennas are in locations um, that you can't access or if you can, it's still fenced off and we don't encourage visitors. But sometimes uh, if you just check with your local one, there's a chance that they might and all of the technicians usually are super happy to answer people's questions. All right, final one on the continental US is Hancock, New Hampshire. So super uh, Northeast and Northwest of Boston. And uh, this is the oldest town in America to host one of these antennas, which is pretty cool. And that one also will have the terrible winter weather and nice summer weather. Uh, you can hear more about that when we talk to the operator, Jessica, again. And lastly, the easternmost antenna is in the US Virgin Islands on St. Croix. And that is just to the east of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean Windward Islands um, all start here. And this one is also um, unique. We normally have little heaters on top of the, uh, what we call the feed horns where the signals get sent into the receivers and St. Croix, because it's so nice and tropical, doesn't need them. So we could take them away. Um, but the con of being there is all of this um, salt water, meaning salty air. So there does, it's a battle of corrosion that does happen there. And the dish has to be painted much more often. Um, and occasionally has to deal with hurricanes, which it did uh, in the last couple of years. Okay, so the VLA, VLBA can be even more powerful than just itself. So we talked about how the power of the VLBA is its long baselines, but it has the power to partner with other instruments and observatories around the world, creating even more long baselines sort of um, upping the ante, as you will. It has observed with um, other instruments and telescopes in all seven continents, including Antarctica, and a few orbiting spacecraft. So just to highlight a little of those, this is the Antarctic telescope. This is the German Antarctic Receiving Station. Um, it was established here in 1991, and it's part of run by Germany's space agency, DLR, and it tracks satellites, um, but it also um, can cover um, satellites that are not seen by any other telescopes on Earth. So if they go around the South Pole, they would normally lose contact with their other tracking satellites. And these are two um, of the orbiting telescopes that the VLBA has, or has observed simultaneously with. This one on the left is um, HELCA, the Highly Advanced Laboratory for Communications and Astronomy. Um, that's built by Japan. And the one on the right is a Russian satellite, uh, Radio Astron. And one of the really cool things is that as part of the early science program with Radio Astron, 
it uh, joined not only the VLBA, but also the Green Bank Telescope and the VLA. And together, the resolution um, that that entire combined system had was one ten thousandth of an arc second. And if you don't know what that means, it's okay. It just is several hundred times better than the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope um, and the highest resolution ever achieved in astronomy. Another thing the VLBA is um, used for is it can be triggered by other astronomical phenomenon or observations and then um, asked to skew, slew, sorry, over to point at those targets and see what's happening after whatever the initial event was. And some of those events are um, gamma ray bursts. So these are bursts of gamma ray radiation, which is the highest frequency of light that we are uh, able to detect. And if you actually take the radio telescope and look afterwards, there is a little bit of a radio afterglow. So that's what this is showing. This is an actual observation um, of a gamma ray burst in the 90s. And then um, for those of you that have heard of LIGO and gravitational waves, um, black holes merging, but also specifically the gravitational waves detection that dealt with neutron stars, a pair of neutron stars merging. Um, the VLBA was uh, key in doing a follow-up observation to that. And that was even more interesting because the VLBA is observing radio wavelengths, which are a type of light in the electromagnetic spectrum, but gravitational waves are a completely different messenger, so to speak. So those are ripples in space-time. So this was a, a really cool way to show that these events not only produce gravitational waves, but they also produced electromagnetic radiation. And now perhaps one of maybe the least known, but to me, one of the coolest things um, with the VLBA is that it literally can be used to study everything from the ground that you're standing on to the farthest objects in space. And what I mean by the ground you're standing on is that it is actually a part of an international reference, terrestrial reference frame. Um, and so the 10 VLBA antennas are some of the most precisely known spots on the surface of the Earth. Um, and this is important because it essentially, this reference frame is tracking how the surface of the Earth, um, where locations are with respect to each other, and then also how are they moving over time. Um, so one of the things that the, the terrestrial reference frame really helped solidify was the acceptance of plate tectonics um, as a theory um, prior to having a lot of evidence really showing that parts of the earth were drifting and moving away and towards from each other. Um, that was really hard for a lot of geologists to believe until they were faced with this kind of evidence. And the VLBA played a key role in just adding to that evidence. And it can also be stud, um, used to track earth rotations um, and even locations of uh, quasars in space can help solidify the locations of the telescopes on Earth. It works both ways. So what I would like to do now is actually ask one of our tour guides, who's a grad student at New Mexico Tech, Montana Williams, to join me. I'm going to stop sharing. And Montana, if you turn your camera on. I thought I stopped sharing. Yes, I did. Um, so hi, Montana. Summer. I would love to hear more about your research, what your research um, area is, and how the VLBA actually plays a role in your research. For sure. So I work with cute radio stars. Um, and what those are is they're just stars that emit in the radio. And I happen to think that they're very cute. Um, there's nothing too abnormal about them. So every star technically radiates in radio. We just usually don't see it because it's very faint emission. So we have like some radio um, data of our sun um, in the radio. So that's really cool. And more specifically, what I do with them is I'm just curious about their nature. So when I was an undergraduate, actually, I proposed to get time on the VLBA. Um, which was really daunting at first because 
when you write the proposal, you write both the scientific justification. So I was saying like, hi, I would like to look at these radio stars because I think they're really cute. Please give me cute images. Um, and then I had to write the technical justification, which was very tricky because then I had to go in and like tell them what I wanted the correlator to be set up as and all of those things. Um, and I had never actually done radio astronomy before that. So it was really weird to like suddenly be trying to say, I want to do this with radio astronomy when I didn't know what it was. But through that process, I learned a lot about radio astronomy um, and more about radio stars. And so that's actually what geared me to do radio astronomy is another really cool thing. And that's why I'm here. Well, that's so cool. So the VLBA plays a role in your origin story. Yes, it is the the antenna or the array that is my origin story. <laughs> um, but what do I do with my data? So I have observed data. I have proposed to get the data. I have um, I've calibrated some of the data. And so what I'm interested in is seeing what those radio stars look like in the radio, because that can tell us things about like um, stellar theory. It can tell us about like what the magnetic fields are doing with the stars or just kind of understanding these cool stars. And the VLBA is better for that than like the yes. VLBA because- of... Because the stars um, are point sources. And so when we observe, we want to observe basically the star itself and like any like um, the atmosphere of the star and so because the VLBA is so big and acts like a dish like the size of the United States we can really see like all those like details in a sense and get a lot more information about the star versus just it's there it's a radio star <laughs> right or or here's a picture of 100 radio stars yeah you know, no I want to look at this one yeah, and so, so there's actually some of them where they've been able to get like the stellar diameter from like the images so we can actually see basically the full star and like you kind of see like the dips and emissions. So you're getting like a picture wow. of the star in radio. So right. It's really cool. That is fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Um, and so what phase, what stage of your PhD are you in right now? Um, I'm finishing up classes and um, I've been doing a little bit of the research on it. So mostly I've been just calibrating the data and trying to figure out how to calibrate the radio data, um, which is really cool. And it's different for the VLBA than the VLA almost entirely. So that's another interesting thing. It's no small task I've heard. It's not, <laughs> um, especially when you're learning it for the first time because you're giving it all these commands of, I want you to use this antenna as a reference antenna and I want to tell you to like use this as a calibrator and all of these things you're like but what is what is a calibrator and so it's really cool yeah fantastic well thank you so much for sharing yeah thank you okay so if you turn your camera off and if um I will share just briefly because I want to show introduce who's coming up next so our next guest speaker, which we're super excited to have with us, is one of the operators of the VLBA telescope. So Jessica King um, works here at NRAO, and she is an operations specialist. Um, and this is a picture of her in the VLBA control room, which actually right now to me is just on the other side of my wall over here. Um, and she's sitting in there right now, so she can show you around. And my colleague Faith is gonna have a conversation with Jessica. So let me stop sharing. And why don't, Faith and Jessica, why don't you turn your cameras on? And I will go off and hand it over to you, Faith. Hey everyone, so thanks so much for joining us, Jessica. We're really excited to have you and excited to hear about um, what you do. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. So why don't you start by telling us about yourself? So what's your background and how did you come to be here at the VLBA? Um, okay, so um, I graduated from Vassar College uh, back in 2014. Um, I have a double major in astronomy and physics. Um, and while I was at Vassar, uh, I was working with the um, optical telescope there. They had this um, beautiful Schmidt Cassegrain with a 32 inch primary mirror. And I just loved working with that telescope. I loved operating it. I loved troubleshooting it. I loved taking the data. Um, so that's what I decided I wanted to do. I wanted to go into being a telescope operator. Um, so after three years of rigorous searching, um, 
there I saw an opportunity come up for the uh, VLBA and I thought to myself that would be the coolest like the epitome of being a telescope operator for me so I applied and here I am <laughs> yeah, that's true. It doesn't get much cooler than getting to control a telescope that's the size of a continent, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, what's an average day at your job like? Like what sort of things do you do regularly as an operator? Um, so we actually are in charge of uh, a lot of different things. Um, so we're in charge of pre-processing projects. Um, so once projects get scheduled to run on our telescopes, uh, we are in charge of sending the project scripts out to the telescope so that they know, okay, here's what we're looking at. Here's the recording schedule. Um, and we also have to uh, post-process the projects as well, uh, get the monitor data, um, check uh, the um, pulse cal information. Um, that, which is just a uh, fancy measurement of uh, the signal that's going through the antennas. Um, and we also have to, of course, while the project is running, uh, we have to keep an eye on the antennas, make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to because they like to not. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we have to make sure that they're, um, that the timing is correct at each station because each station have to have exactly precise timing. Um, in order for us to actually correlate the data afterwards. Um, and of course, we have to make sure that there's no horrible faults happening. Like we have a lot of issues with like the focus rotation module at the, at the apex of the antennas. Um, those like to get stuck a lot, especially in the cold weather. <laughs> um, and of course we have to make sure that the, um, the elevation and the azimuth motors are functioning properly. Um, and we also have to monitor the cryos because um, all the receivers have to be kept very, very cold. <clears throat> Excuse me, very, very cold. Um, so we have to monitor those and make sure that there's no issues because uh, those also like to malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also have to uh, correlate the data. Um, so actually what I can do is I can show you. Um, so this is the monitoring station. We have these two giant screens up right here. Um, so this is our main operating page. Uh, we can keep an eye on all the antennas right here. Um, right now we actually have uh, two different projects running. So we have uh, some pointing files that are going on at most of the sites. And then um, one of them is actually running uh, a track sun program. Uh, that's our Hancock antenna in New Hampshire. Um, so this is where we monitor everything. Uh, we've got this scary looking alert screen right here that shows us generally um, like what kind of major problems are going on. Uh, we have a chat screen so we can talk to our site techs. Um, we have, I know you can't see super well, but uh, the cryo monitoring screen. Uh, we also keep an eye on the weather at all the sites. Um, and then over here we just have like, um, couple of extra terminals that we use. Uh, I've got another weather screen up here. And we also have a web page open so that we can uh, keep track of like what projects are coming up, um, as well as like general searches on stuff we need to do. And real quick, I'm just going to take you over here. Um, so we are running correlation right now. So we're taking all the data from all 10 sites and combining it into one useful package that the scientists can then reduce down. And over here, so these are our um, playback units. Um, so the packs come in from the sites. Um, as, as we were talking about earlier, we have them on these big giant, like pretty much giant flash drives. <laughs> <laughs> sent here to our operation uh, center and then we put them up on the wall and then we can correlate from there. And there's a lot of them. Yes, we have a lot of packs and we have a lot of units we can use. Um, so they're actually correlating right now. Um, so we have a lot to keep track of here. Yeah, I was going to say there's a lot going on between all your different screens and everything that you have to keep track of at any given time. Yes, it's very important to be diligent. Because um, there's like a major problem, we have to try to be on it like that, 
or right. risk, you know, damaging these million dollar instruments. <laughs> right. And from what I understand, um, the VLBA operators operate on shifts solo, right? And your shifts vary a lot, like between when you're working. Correct. Um, so we're on rotating shifts. Um, so during the week, we do um, eight hour shifts. And then on weekends, we have 12 hour shifts. Um, so it goes, uh, basically, we do um, five days of day shift, five days of evenings, and then five days of midnights. And then we have to go into doing the 12 hour midnight shifts. Um, so for example, next week, I'm going to be doing uh, five days of eight hour midnights. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy for the sleep schedule, huh? It is. It is. It's, it can be brutal. Um, but I love what I do. So it's really not that big of an issue for me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that seems like it would be very important in a job like that too. So For it sure. looks, it looks really cool. And how long, um, so when the VLBA is taking an observation on average, how long do those observations last? Um, so they can range anywhere from two hours to 24 hours. Um, on wow. average, yeah, we do, we do 24 hour projects. Um, so on average, the projects are usually like six to eight hours long. Um, but, uh, we do, um, we've also done really short ones that are less than an hour, but typically they're any, any range from two to 24 hours. Yeah, makes sense. And of course, like um, Summer already told us, the antennas are in widely varying locations. So they are experiencing very different weather and environments at any given time. So do you have any particular antennas that pose greater challenges for you than others? Um, so I would say our hand clock antenna in New Hampshire um, definitely has a lot of New England weather. Um, so a lot of snowstorms, a lot of nor'easters. Um, so that one's tricky, especially in the winter. Um, our North Liberty antenna uh, also has a lot of snowstorms to deal with. Um, the, sorry, that's the Iowa antenna. Um, it also gets very, very cold there. Like it's actually our coldest site. Um, yeah, so uh, once the antennas get to below freezing, like below zero degrees Fahrenheit, like we have to pull them for the safety of the antenna. And uh, we actually had one week uh, in January where North Liberty was out for the whole week because it was oh. constantly below zero Fahrenheit. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brewster, of course, also uh, Brewster, Washington also gets snowstorms. Um, and with our St. Croix antenna, um, that one, the biggest issue we really have to worry about is, you know, windy conditions and hurricanes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And um, so for new developments with the VLBA, have there any um, been any recent exciting upgrades or new things added to the VLBA? Um, yeah, so we've actually been working on upgrading our internet at all the sites. Um, and because of that, um, all the sites actually have the internet capability now to do real-time fringing, which is uh, really cool because um, in the past, what we've had to do was we've had to run, um, if we wanted to check that the antennas were fringing, we had to run these very short, very, very short 15 seconds um, fringe checks. Um, so what that would do is it would take a 15 second recording of data. And then we had to download that uh, to here um, in order to correlate that data. But now with the internet upgrade, we're actually able to see the data coming in in real time, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so that's a, a still in development, but um, it's something that they're going to be rolling out very soon that we'll actually be able to uh, test on a regular basis. Um, so that'll be really exciting if we can actually see the data coming in in real time. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And um, so many scientists uh, use the VLBA from all over the world, right? So from, you can be in any country to use it. Is that correct? Correct. Um, we've done, we do a lot of projects for a lot of different countries, um, anywhere from, uh, Chile, uh, Mexico, uh, Italy, Germany, uh, Russia, China, Japan. We, we do projects from all over. 
and students get to use it too, right? Because Montana told us about her experience of using it as um, a college student. Do uh, high schoolers get to use it? Do many college, um, college students get to use it as well? Or is it primarily scientists? Um, it is primarily scientists, but we do run uh, student projects as well. Um, like I, I know that there have been a lot of like uh, graduate students who have uh, used our telescopes to, um, to do their thesis. Um, and I, I know that they have like a, a summer student program. Um, so in the summer, we actually run more student projects than we normally do, but we're, we're definitely open to uh, running student projects. Awesome. And they just would have to submit a proposal for that, right? Yes, they do have to go through the proposal submission process. But of course, with the help of, of their like advisors or uh, the contacts that or the scientists that they're working with here at the NRAO, um, we, we can we work with them on that. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Oh, um, one that we got from the Q&A for you as well. So do you operate as the um, duty officer in coordinating repairs to the 10 telescopes that are so many miles apart? Um, yes, we do. Um, so uh, our site techs um, at all the sites are on call 24-7. Um, uh, they don't get a they don't get a break, sadly. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so especially like, you know, during the day, it's um, the site techs are, of course, like on site. So they're also able to monitor their antennas. Um, but uh, once they're off shift um, and on call, um, it's up to us to keep an eye out for any problems that are happening. And we have to notify them and let them know as soon as possible um, so that they can get out there and fix it. Um, there are some things that are not like huge priority, like um, if there's a cryo that warms, but it's for a receiver that we're not using until like the next day, uh, then stuff like that can wait until morning. But if it's like a serious motor problem, then um, we have to notify the site techs and they have to uh, get out there and get it fixed. Yeah, makes sense. And then, um, so what kind of like collaborations does the VLBA do with other telescopes? You're with the VLA and do you do many projects with other telescopes as well? Uh, we do actually. Um, so uh, we also do projects uh, with Green Bank, um, but we also do projects with um, the, uh, um, what's the VLBI. Um, so we do a lot of projects that involve um, a lot of the European telescopes as part of the VLBI initiative. Um, so uh, a lot like in Germany, we work with a couple of telescopes in Sweden, um, Italy, Spain. Um, and of course we also, uh, there's, um, I believe you can pull up actually, um, there's a map of the uh, VLBI um, antennas. Um, if you pull that up, you can see like there's so many and we actually collaborate with quite a lot of those. Um, right. So yeah, we, we work with telescopes all over the world, which is, which is really cool. Sure. And then um, we also have a question about like, can you explain how the data from each antenna is combined together in a bit more detail, just like how um, it's added back together once it gets sent to Socorro? Um, so it's, it's kind of a complicated process, but uh, basically um, what it's doing is um, we're taking the, uh, the radiation and we're translating it into a voltage. Um, and that voltage actually retains the information, uh, like the amplitude and, it, and the phase of the original signal. Um, so we, we can take that and essentially add those voltages together so that it effectively makes like one super telescope's data. And then we can take that voltage and retranslate it back into what the signal would have been. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a very complicated process because we have to be extremely accurate with our station timing down to nanoseconds. Um, so right. <laughs> that's why it's very, very important that all of our uh, stations are in sync um, because otherwise the data kind of gets uh, a little messed up. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of like a little more technical gist of it. Um, but there's 
the data goes through a lot of different transformation processes. Um, yeah. And since you're getting so much, it would no, no doubt be really important for it to be synced so um, exactly just because otherwise it'd be really easy for it to get thrown off because, because there's so much of it. Yes, and then, exactly. And then speaking of um, the data, so when um, observations are taking place, do you ever directly work with or coordinate with the scientists who um, made the proposal for those projects? Like, do, they, do you talk to them ever? Um, unfortunately, we don't get to do that a whole lot. Um, there's a couple of uh, staff scientists that uh, we do work with, uh, usually when they're running tests, like sometimes they'll call us and like ask how their, uh, how the test project is going, but uh, we unfortunately don't really get to um, coordinate with uh, most of the scientists during their projects. Um, but uh, of course, we do send an email out afterwards. Uh, to let them know like your project ran and then any like potential problems that there might have been. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. All right. Well, that well, thank you so much for telling us um all about what you do, Jessica. This has been really fascinating and we're still going to get to um continue talking. We're just now going to open up to a Q&A from our audience. Well, more. I asked you a couple questions from our Q&A, but we can um continue that. All right. So um, here's one from the Q&A. Can the VLBA operate if one or more of the antennas are out of service? Um, yes, they can. Um, so it kind of depends on the nature of the project that we're running. Uh, like some, uh, some scientists request that there are a certain number of antennas are available. Um, so it really depends on what the scientist is looking for. But uh, generally, uh, yes, we can operate with um, one telescope out, two telescopes out, sometimes three. Um, it, it just really depends on what the scientist wants. Yeah, makes sense. Um, let's see. Um, so we have, how long does it take to correlate all of the baselines once the data arrives? Um, it depends on what like it depends on the size of the actual data um like some projects uh record in much higher uh bit rates than others um so it kind of depends um typically though uh it takes about 70 percent of the time that the actual observation ran so for example um if we have like a one hour project that ran uh to correlate it takes about like 30 to 35 or 30 to 30 to 40 minutes rather uh, awesome and um we have another one here that says um hello your job is amazing what has been the most interesting discovery that you've witnessed at the vlba Ooh, the most interesting uh we do a lot of really interesting uh work um I, we uh, we observe so many different projects, like from like black hole research to star formation, galaxy formation, uh, quasars, blazars. Like we do so much really fascinating work. I think recently uh, one of the coolest things um, was uh, they successfully used our telescopes to bounce a signal off the surface of the moon, and they were able to map the surface just using that radio signal. So that's really exciting because that could pave the way for uh, future exoplanet discoveries and um, further exoplanet research, maybe on their surfaces. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's see. Wow, we have a lot of um, great questions in here. How powerful of a computer is needed to reduce the data? very <laughs> <laughs> yeah with that much data uh, yeah so i'm not exactly sure like what kind of power uh, specifically that we're looking at but we have a lot of different correlator nodes that are um it, behind the uh the racks that i showed you um i think there's a uh, 20 or so of them so we basically have like 20 supercomputers sitting back there uh combing through all this data and correlating it um, unfortunately, I don't have any more specifics than that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Um, so what's the most difficult troubleshooting you've had to do while the VLBA is observing? Ooh, uh, I would say I get really 
persnickety about the motors and the motor currents um because i'm always afraid um that like i'm always afraid that i'm putting too much stress on the motors especially in winter when it's really icy um so i i think um because having a blown uh azimuth or elevation motor can be very hazardous um to my health as well as the antennas. <laughs> um, so like recently, um, one of our antennas had an elevation motor that just completely failed. Um, I mean, it wasn't anybody's fault, it just, it just failed. Um, and so what happened was the dish actually was not able to hold itself up. So it went like this and it was horrifying. Oh no. <laughs> oh gosh that sounds awful yeah so i i would say that that's definitely like the thing that makes me the most nervous is just putting too much strain on the motors yeah and i'd imagine too like not being able to physically see what's going on there too probably makes it more difficult because you just sort of have to use your imagination to yeah exactly especially in winter when you're doing a night shift and it's it's dark, but you know, it's icy, but you don't know how bad it is. Or if there's like yeah. just a new layer of frost forming, it, it's just, uh, that, that definitely worries me the most. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And so, um, was the location of the antennas planned in advance to be able to do interferometry properly, or did the calculations for the baselines come after you built after the antennas were built and installed? Um, so from my understanding, um, the general areas were planned out uh, when they were planning the VLBA. Um, so they, they picked out 10 like ideal locations just in a general area. Like they knew they wanted one in like, the Northeast and one uh, a little bit more uh, westward from there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. So they, they did the general planning and then they went in and pinpointed locations based on cost, uh, how far away they were from big cities and a lot of big RFI sources. Um, so it, that, that, was, that was my understanding was that they had a general plan and then they went to specifics just based on little factors like that. Cool. And um, how fast can the VLBA antennas get to their target? So from whatever they're pointing at now to if you point to a new target, how fast can they move to it? Um, so they actually move surprisingly fast. Um, let me see. I think I have a note here somewhere about how fast they actually slew. Uh, yes, I do. So for azimuth, um, they slew about 90 degrees per minute. For elevation, it's 30 degrees per minute. Interesting. Um, nice. So the but so just to remind everybody at home too. So since azimuth is um, the north south like direction wise. That means it can go, I guess, an entirely different direction. So from dead north to dead east or um, so on minute. in a minute. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, they, they're huge instruments and they move surprisingly fast. Yeah. And then altitude, um, 30 degrees. Yeah, that is really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And it's All incredible right. to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then... So what is your usual signal to noise ratio? Because of course there's noise caused by a lot of other radio sources of which there are a lot. And so how do you extract the real signal that you're trying to look at from space from the noise? Um, so that can be a tricky process. Um, it kind of depends on the strength of your source. Um, but uh, basically, um, so that's something that gets more involved in the, uh, in the actual processing of the data that the scientist does afterwards. Um, so it's kind of up to them to sort through um, and you know they have to be aware of what the weather conditions were. Um, they have to be aware of like any potential problems that the antennas were having. Um, and I, I can kind of speak a little bit on this because I have uh, run my own project on the VLBA and I did actually uh, post process that. So. It, uh, all of my sources were fairly strong though. So it, it's kind of up to you to sort out like, okay, it, you can kind of see generally, like if you have like a, um, like in your data, you'll see like a spike in amplitude or even just like a little bump in amplitude, but you're like, okay, this is gonna be my source. This is what I was looking at. And so you can actually filter all the rest of it out using um, 
apes or casa or uh whatever program you're using um so that's definitely a lot more of the uh data processing step um like we uh here um on the operator end uh basically what we do to reduce the noise is we have to make sure that the receivers are as cold as possible um and uh we will note in the logs if we see any anything strange like uh if uh, RMS counts are really high, um, which is basically like an indicator of noise. Um, but that's that's about all we do uh, from our end. It's mostly up to the uh, to the scientists reducing the data. Great. Yeah. And then um, here's one about um, another personal question for you. So did you have um, any difficulties working and studying in STEM? as um, like, and then do you have any suggestions to young girls who want to get a job like yours? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think that um, being a woman trying to get into STEM is obviously not an easy task just because it's such a male dominated field. Um, at Vassar, um, I, I was pretty fortunate because Vassar is uh, still predominantly female, um, but in my classes, uh, you know, I was taking like high level astronomy, high level physics, they were still male dominated classes. Um, and sometimes I felt like it was difficult for me to be taken seriously as a woman. Um, but what my advice to any young girls who are watching, um, who want to get into science, like be a force to be reckoned with, like, <laughs> like um you know don't ever let anybody tell you what you can or can't do um you know like you you can do it you are capable you are just as competent as men you know don't don't let men like try to walk all over you like be like be strong like you can do it um it's Absolutely. it it is a tough field to break into, but if you just keep at it and you just don't give up, then you will get there. It, it took me three years after I graduated to find this job, but I didn't give up. I kept at it and here I am now. Um, so just don't give up, believe in yourself, be strong and show those men that you can do it. For sure, yeah, here you are having the time of your life, right? And nobody I, I, can tell you what you can or can't do except yourself so exactly yeah all right so i think that is a great question to end on so thank you so much again jessica for um being here today and taking the time to talk to us and tell us about all this great stuff this was uh such great information and i hope everyone else really enjoyed it too i hope so too and thank you so much for having me and thank you for everybody who's here watching of course and um, okay, so now we're just going to um, wrap, wrap up here. So um, just have a few more slides for you. So for anyone who wants to see more about, learn more about the VLBA, all 10 antennas have their own webcams. And so um, you can look and see what the webcams are currently seeing at any of the 10 sites. And um, we'll have the link to those. Thank you, Montana. Montana just put those in the chat. And again, they'll also be in the email that you'll get at the end of this session. So um, you can, they update every 10 minutes from what I understand, except the Los Alamos one that isn't in real time, but the other ones update every 10 minutes. Is that correct? Uh, yes, correct. Awesome. And um, Yes, and so next month, um, we're going to have another virtual tour on March 27th, same time, uh, 1 p.m. That'll be Mountain Daylight Time. We'll be on uh, Daylight Savings by then. So um, you can register for that as well on our website. And um, we hope you'll come to that as well. So that'll be talking about what we want the future of the very large array to look like. And um, yes, thank you everyone so much for coming. We really appreciate um, you being here and have a great rest of your weekend.